I'm Robert Emmett Hernan. I'm the head of Bluestack Productions, Inc., the publisher of Irish Environment, an online resource for environmental matters on the island of Ireland. I'm very happy today to be here in Copenhagen uh, interviewing the director of the European Environment Agency, Jacqueline McGlade. Jacqueline, you're very welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you, Robert. Jacqueline, I wonder if you could tell the audience uh, just generally what the uh, environmental, uh, European Environment Agency is and what it does. The European Environment Agency is actually a European institution. It's founded through a regulation which went through Parliament mm. and the Council. And its aim is to provide the information required to support policy making, but also to test the effectiveness of policies in the environment field and the sectors mm. that actually have an impact, so agriculture, transport, energy. And to give an overall picture to citizens, we have 490 million citizens in 25 languages, about what's actually happening today. And it was started in 1994? It was begun actually physically here in 1994. Uh -huh. However, what happened was that prior to that, there had been many years, in fact two decades or so, of environmental legislation. Uh -huh. And the Parliament particularly saw a need to have an independent body that would then make assessments on a regular basis and provide this information to policymakers and to citizens. The idea was that agencies which were just beginning to emerge in the landscape of institutions would find their homes in the member states, so these were not going to be inside Brussels in the kind of inner circle. And that independence was therefore reinforced and there was a kind of a bidding war, I have to say, mm -hmm. and Denmark was extremely keen to have us, and uh, they won the war, in a sense, and we then found ourselves in this beautiful location. Now, it, it, the independence of the agency is a very critical <coughs> issue in the island of Ireland, because the, in the Republic of Ireland, the uh, EPA is deemed to be an independent agency. In Northern Ireland, it was hoped to be that, but it didn't become that. It became part of the, uh, the uh, agency. So in what sense do you see the uh, EEA as an independent agency? Well, just as the EPA in Ireland has this kind of separation between the ministry, we would see ourselves as having a separation from the Commission, from the Council and from the Parliament. The independence comes, though, by, I think, a very careful governance model, which is that we work on the basis of looking at information that the countries provide under compliance and legislation, also looking at voluntary data, and gradually working through a quality assurance procedure but at the end of the day, we hold the pen mm. on a report. Mm. So it is our opinion obtained, so to speak, independently of the country's views, depoliticized, in other words. And I'm not mm. saying always that the numbers speak for themselves. There is always some interpretation. But we hold with the view that, with a consideration and with consultation, that we can genuinely give a true insight into what is happening and potentially identify where there are political difficulties. Okay, and the hiring process for staff for the EEA agency is different from being hired within the commission or any of the other? We have exactly the same staff regulations, uh -huh. but what we see in the agencies is a preponderance of what we would call temporary agents. These are people uh -huh. who come from across the entire membership of the agency. Uh -huh. So there is a marked difference. We actually have 32 member countries. We uh -huh. include the EFTA countries, that's Norway, Iceland, Liechtenstein. We also have Switzerland and Turkey as members. Uh -huh. and and we have the West Balkans as what we would call associate countries. So in total we are 39 countries, not the EU 27. Mm -hmm. So we draw our staff from our member countries through open competitions, people can apply. We also have national experts who come and we have contract agents. So we have a kind of similar mixture mm -hmm. as the Commission, but we have a preponderance of people who come here for shorter periods of time. Okay. And now one of the, one of the functions of the agency <coughs> is to provide scientific knowledge and technical support. And do you actually fund that research uh, through, in, through third parties or do you gather that information from existing sources? We have a mixture mm -hmm. of both. Yeah. We actually spend about a third of our budget uh, commissioning work with colleagues in institutions all across Europe. Mm -hmm. We have um, part of our founding regulation describing what is called the IONET, which is the environmental information system mm -hmm. spread through all the institutions of countries. So it's like a big pyramid mm -hmm. and on any one day up to 3,000 people might be doing something in their country setting mm -hmm. for the agency. Mm -hmm. So it's a phenomenally um, powerful and unique network. There's nothing like it in the rest of the world. And that kind of goodwill, that collegiality, can be research, it can be checking reports, it could be doing translations. So it's the whole production line from mm. scientific knowledge through research, through report writing, up to the point where we might make even a policy recommendation. Another function is that you, um, that you um, 
monitor the effectiveness of the implementation mm -hmm. uh, of EC directives and other legislation within member states. And, and while you don't do an enforcement role, um, that data is then used for enforcement? Is that referred to the uh, Commission for Enforcement Purposes? There's a certain amount of reporting mm. that is done under a range of legislation. If mm. I take biodiversity, there is um, legislation which has to do with the Natura 2000 sites. Mm -hmm. So countries will report directly to the agency mm. and then through that we would then make a national assessment, mm. the status and so on. And in the end, we have seen emerging a very different view of what compliance really means. Mm. So I would say historically the Commission was very concentrated on compliance in the transposition of laws from the European level into mm. the national setting. And if you are an advocate or a lawyer you'd understand that it's very important how that wording actually looks or what it looks like in the national setting. Mm -hmm. What the country and what the public thinks about implementation is, well, is it happening in mm -hmm. the real world? Mm -hmm. And this is very much our territory. So we see whether policies are delivering the environmental outcomes that they were intended to. Mm -hmm. And so what we're observing now is a much more, um, how should I say, structured discussion mm -hmm. around implementation, policy effectiveness and compliance. Mm -hmm. So I think what you're going to see in the future is a far more um, disaggregated approach, mm -hmm. looking at what is working, what isn't working. Is it because what's on the statute books is not well written? Is it that mm -hmm. the environmental conditions are so complicated? Is it that the institutional setting is poor, therefore it can't be implemented? Mm -hmm. Or is it simply that other sectors, other parts of society, other parts of the economy are just so dominant mm -hmm. that there's mm -hmm. no chance this will ever succeed? Mm -hmm. And it's that kind of work where the agency, I think, plays its critical role. One of the priorities for the agency, as for many of us now, is of course trying to halt the decline in biodiversity. 2010 is gone, mm -hmm. uh, it hasn't halted, but we're still working on it. And what is the work of the agency? I know there's a project called uh, Eureka 2012. Mm -hmm. what, what is that project and what is the agency doing for that? Well, in fact, Eureka mm -hmm. almost um, preempted where we are today. It anticipated some time ago that we were not going to really meet the biodiversity targets mm -hmm. and said, well, it's because we're not really working at the right scale. We need to be working at the scale of ecosystems. Mm -hmm. I have to admit that things have changed dramatically in the last year or so, having recognised that we didn't meet our targets to halt biodiversity. Europe as a whole came together and agreed on a post-2010 action plan in which ecosystem services are now at the core. Mm -hmm. So we've kind of moved on a little bit and are now seeing that at the agency we will work on the methodologies and the data and information required to produce what we would see as the European ecosystem assessment, mm -hmm. where we would differentiate between the, the stocks and the flows. So what are the ecosystems and what are the flows of water, etc., between them? Mm -hmm. We would see that we would have regulating and supporting services mm -hmm. combined and then provisioning, so that's agriculture, food production, fish for food, mm -hmm. and for example, forestry for wood and timber. Conservation is another kind of a service. And then we're able now, in anticipation of all the new data sets coming in from the space programs, to really facilitate a yearly update on the status of ecosystems and how their, their trends are. Are they deteriorating, degrading, getting better? So we see a whole change in the way in which we will service the policy world and citizens to know really what their what the effects of different policies are. Okay, now, interesting, because what we've been talking about is systems, uh, mm -hmm. and now I'd like to shift gears a little bit yeah. and talk about an issue that's very dear to our hearts, and that is how you communicate some of this information to the general public. And biodiversity is an example. Mm -hmm. Ireland just did a state of knowledge trying to survey what the biodiversity was like, and 60% of the, bio is, is the species are invertebrates. It's hard to sell <laughs> to the public, you know, yeah. the, the importance of invertebrates. How do you do that? It's the same thing with climate change for mm. skeptics. How does the agency reach out to the public to try and persuade them of the importance of something like biodiversity? We have, I think, quite some success in doing that, but it's because we tend to take a view that um, the citizen is a very smart person on the whole, mm -hmm. maybe sceptical or not, but what they need is the connection between the, well, the, the arguments. And so, for example, in biodiversity, something which grabs people's attention is uh, pollination, bees. Mm -hmm. And therefore, by linking the story of bees and honey making mm -hmm. with the demise of invertebrates as a group, mm -hmm. 
already people can get it because most people understand that you need bees to pollinate flowers and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So we try to reach out using various devices. We have um, a publication called Signals, which is very orientated towards mm -hmm. schools. We do an enormous number of uh, lectures and speeches, and I do a lot of public speaking. Mm -hmm. We produce little films, we produce mm -hmm. movies, um, and I would think that our public outreach is very important. However, we have noticed in the last few years a very strong movement within citizen groups to be able to, to want to communicate directly with us. Mm -hmm. So changing the agency from a one-way device, in other words, we tell people what we think we know, mm -hmm. to, no, actually we're listening, oh, and actually now we want to hear what you have to say. This is where I think the genuine social transformation is happening. Mm -hmm. So together with tweeting and Facebook and so on, there's this surge of knowledge that is sitting there waiting mm -hmm. to be tapped. And I think our role is to say, mm -hmm. what's the quality of it? How mm -hmm. could we use it best? How could we share it? And how can we make certain that people feel that if they've gone to the trouble of telling us something, that that will then be used somehow in our assessments? Mm -hmm. So we've been working really, I think, at a full pace with the IT industry, with all our countries, with many citizen groups, including indigenous peoples, to create a platform, the Eye on Earth platform. Mm -hmm. We already have a prototype running where we have engaged for the last two years with citizens telling us what they think about air quality, about water quality, mm -hmm. in relation to the official data. But by the end of the year, we will have, I think, what is already being described as the world's most advanced leading information uh, system. You'll mm -hmm. be able to have it on your telephones, on platforms, yeah. everywhere. Mm -hmm. And you'll be able to, as a normal citizen, create an intelligent map which tells you what's happening, where you mm -hmm. are, mm -hmm. in relation to biodiversity, why should you care, air quality, water quality, and so on. Mm -hmm. And really get engaged, if you want to, mm -hmm. in a process which means that around your own community, you can sense that there's a, a way in which others will get to know about what you're doing, and vice versa. I'm saying it's a democratization of information, mm -hmm. um, but it's more than that. It's about participation in a way where it's meaningful because it's done at, at the individual level, but where we can manage that kind of volume of traffic mm -hmm. and equip people with the most up-to-date information available. How do you evaluate the, the data coming in from this in this two-way conversation mm -hmm. between the general public? How do you filter through stuff that's useful and, okay. and valuable and stuff that's not? We have different layers. We have mm. um, communities who are very organized. I might put mm. the bird watchers in that setting where they have their own mm. sophisticated ways of mm -hmm. evaluating each other. Mm -hmm. And um, for example, people posting where they've observed a particular bird species. A twitcher might say, I've seen this species. And then mm. others will say, yes, we agree, we've seen it or whatever. So those communities we're very comfortable with. Mm -hmm. They have a self-evaluation and that fits very well with our reporting. What we see are burgeoning communities who want to repeat that, but maybe not to such a highly sophisticated way. Mm -hmm. Invasive alien species, very good example where young groups of people are coming together and saying, wherever you are on your telephone, you will be able to download the local set of invasive alien species, plants or animals. Mm -hmm. If you spot it, you tell us, we know where your phone is, and then we'll check whether your photograph is the right one, mm -hmm. and you get a bit of feedback. And mm -hmm. then gradually you build up a community, and we then mm -hmm. use that information. And then in air quality and water quality, one is almost like a social exchange. I'm on the beach today, the beach looks fantastic, come on down. Mm -hmm. And we give a kind of a very simple, what we call a semantic set of words, mm -hmm. which we've found over two or three years really helps to corral, <laughs> I would say, the wild west of what people might want to tell us <laughs> into something very meaningful. Uh -huh. And the same with air quality. Uh -huh. And what is fantastic about air quality is that, of course, the nose is the most sophisticated instrument on the planet, mm -hmm. better than any instrument you can put out. Mm. So already we see that citizens are anticipating what the metrology, the instrument networks, will mm -hmm. detect. So people who are very sensitive to ozone detect it far sooner than mm -hmm. most of our instruments. Mm -hmm. And therefore, it's not only what we call crowdsourcing, so mm -hmm. by sheer numbers, but we can also see that the quality of it sometimes is much higher mm -hmm. and much earlier than we would get through our own monitoring programs. This is all very exciting mm -hmm. uh, material. And the Eye on Earth is going to be fully operational by the end of the year? We have an Eye on Earth running now, which okay. is fully operational. Uh -huh. But it will go through a huge transformation uh -huh. and where we will then see a global 
platform because currently the Iron Earth is a European platform uh-huh. with the capacity to have multimedia, films, mm. stories and so on. Uh-huh. And what we will do between now and Christmas is to transform that into an open, non-proprietary platform Mm -hmm. with pretty much every GIS, geographic information mapping tool, Mm -hmm. 3D pictures, everything, together with the way that you can publish your data, you can sell your data if you want to, Uh, you can do statistics, analysis, very simple drag and drop, you know, take a spreadsheet, drop it on the map, the points all appear, Mm -hmm. tells you where it's from, data tagging, so you made the data available, you will get the credit for it. Mm -hmm. So all these different facilities and we hope by then that we'll have not only the European Commission and our member countries on board Mm -hmm. but we'd also have a lot of the UN bodies so that for a normal citizen you'll see this huge opening up Mm -hmm. of the availability of information Mm -hmm. that you can then work with and then for the commercial sector, for consultants and so on, I think it will generate an enormous number of uh, new services. And, and people can look at the Eye on Earth now on your website. They can. The Eye on Earth is on our website Great. and they'll get a sense of what we're doing. A lot of the functionality is there. And they can even go right down to their house in their neighborhood uh-huh. and put a little star on it and then they can get the air quality right where they live. And come back in the end of the year and see more. Absolutely. Great. Thank you, Jacqueline. Thank Appreciate you very it. much.